Um, as Justin says, I'm, I'm, I'm Jerry Davis. I'm the academic coordinator of, of Predict TB. And I guess my job in this slot is to really try to engage you with the project, to help you to understand what it's all about, to give you a few of the highlights. But I will emphasize that we are not yet at the end of the first year of the project. So much of what I'm going to say is rather at the, the higher uh, or more strategic level. Um, how do I advance the slides, actually? Wow. OK. Um, <clears throat> things are going well so far. So there are many people in the room who have long been engaged in tuberculosis and will know exactly what I'm talking about. But for those of you who are not, I will just say that tuberculosis is not a disease of the past. About 30% of us worldwide are infected with tuberculosis, and every year there are still more than 8 million new cases of active tuberculosis. And of those, still more than a million people die every single year, which is about a quarter of all the avoidable adult deaths in developing countries. And to put that into perspective, that means that somewhere on the planet, somebody dies of TB every 20 seconds. And you'll say, well, how can that possibly be? Don't we have treatment for tuberculosis? And the answer is that we do. We have had, in fact, for more than 50 years. But the treatment is a combination of four drugs taken for six months, daily or three times a week, sometimes under rather difficult conditions. And in a previous life as a manager of a uh, TB control program, I can tell you that even though the treatment is very efficacious, in practice, it can lack effectiveness and patients struggle to get to the end of their treatment. And the result of that can be that they are not cured and that resistance may develop. And in fact, in the part of South Africa where I previously worked, a new form of uh, tuberculosis emerged in 2006, which was extensively resistant to all of the second-line drugs for TB. So I think there's no question that we do need new drugs for TB. We can't do the job with the drugs that we have. But there are questions about how we might best do that. And as Justin said, about 10 years ago, this realisation that we would soon need new drugs for TB led to a scientific scramble, if you like, to try to discover new drugs and to figure out how to develop them. And this is just a short summary, really, of all the challenges that we face in the TB world. TB is not like other bacteria. There are many problems in in vitro preclinical screening. Even our animal models are probably not representative of the kinds of disease that we see in humans. And so predicting which drugs which single drugs to take into clinical development is difficult. Predicting which combinations we should evaluate is, is equally or more difficult. We have very few PD biomarkers for phase one trials. We can't do crossovers. Um, we have clinical biomarkers, such as so-called early bactericidal activity, which is based on counting colonies of TB in sputum. That was the state of the science 10 years ago. Um, and they don't, well, they don't predict well the results of phase three trials. And just to give you a sense of the challenge, a phase three trial in TB typically needs about 500 patients per arm. And they have to be followed up for two years after they finish their treatment to be sure whether or not they're cured. So the, the cost of phase three trials is escalating. It's of the order now 40 to $50 million for the most recent one. And the capability of trial sites in developing countries to support these trials is rather limited. So we have to get the combinations of drugs right, we have to select the right doses, and we have to evaluate them in the most efficient way possible. And that's what Predict TB is about. So the philosophy and the priorities that we have within Predict TB are to work with regimens as a unit of development, not single drugs, to develop preclinical and clinical methods that will support combination drug development. We want to be able to capitalize on interdisciplinarity. We want, in, within the consortium, we have some of the best experimentalists, some of the best PKPD modelers, and some of the most prominent clinical trialists. And we get all those people in the same room, and we get them to talk to each other. And that way, we've had already some very interesting insights, and that characterizes our approach. Having said all that, we also want to develop new, use new technologies to develop new tools to enhance our understanding of pharmacodynamics and clinical response. And much as in Pharmacog, much of this information and all of this information will be integrated and brought together into the same framework using a PKPD or disease modeling approach. So who are PredictTB? 
Well, Predict TB is a consortium of now 23 partners, three pharmaceutical companies, two SMEs, uh, and 17 academic institutions distributed widely throughout Europe with a budget of about 22 million euros. And the work that we're doing can be visualized like this, what Justin refers to as the blue onion. <clears throat> so the work packages that we have are mutually supportive. And this is a project that will succeed or fail as collectively. It's not that some elements of this will work and others won't. If we're going to do this, it has to succeed or fail as a group. And so if you look at the top of that plot, you can see work packages one, two, three, and four are where we are collecting data, preclinical data, from in vitro systems, from animal systems, and also importantly, from historical and ongoing clinical trials. And into each of those work packages, we will be, we will be cross-fertilizing them with the newest technologies, particularly in, in uh, imaging and in molecular biology, to enhance the pharmacodynamic model that we work with throughout preclinical and early clinical development. And the goal, all of this is supported by, the, by work package five, the PKPD modeling package, and that, the goal of that package is to develop an integrated modeling framework which will support the objectives of the project, which are an optimized preclinical protocol, prediction of clinical efficacy, and optimized clinical trial designs that will enable us to most efficiently evaluate the combinations that we choose. And the strategy is a learning one. So in the first couple of years of the project, we will be evaluating a defined set of compounds, eight compounds for which there is extensive historical clinical trial data. We will be evaluating fairly exhaustively all the combinations of those drugs in a range of preclinical systems. And we will be directly comparing them with the performance of those combinations in clinical trials. And then we will stop, have a hard look at what we've been doing, evaluate the approaches that people are using, and try to refine them uh, and or prune out those that seem not to be predictive. And then there will be a validation step in which we look at new combinations of drugs using this optimized approach. And there'll be further refinement uh, of the strategy during that period. So by the end of the, in four and a half years time, what we hope we will have is a much clearer sense of what elements of the preclinical pathway are most predictive and how can we put them together in the same framework so that we can optimally select the best combinations of drugs to go into more efficient early phase clinical trial designs. So I'll talk very, very briefly just at a top level about some of the activities. So work package one is about in vitro and ex vivo systems and the key goal here is to be a bit more sophisticated about pharmacodynamics. So what we're looking for as an output from work package from these, these systems is not simply an IC90 or a concentration. What we're looking for are rates of killing, possibly on more than one dimension. And so we want to elaborate the current pharmacodynamic model to reflect the fact that we know that in the host and in animal models, TB is heterogeneous. There are multiple different states of the bacterium that might be targeted by different kinds of drugs. And we need to be able to reflect that from the earliest possible stage um, of, of, of development. And more than that, we need to get away from growth-based assays and we need to focus on lethality and cell death because we know that in humans, um, persistence during therapy is our major problem. In Work Package 2, we're taking a whole range of tractable animal models and using them in a refined hierarchical way that responds very strongly to, to the three R's uh, directive. And in fact, what we're doing is trying to use a PKPD modeling approach using some uh, more sophisticated PK assays and uh, animal husbandry techniques. And we will be able to use that then to do full PKPD analysis in a range of animal systems and to compare them with what we know uh, occurs in humans. Work package three is where much of the innovation comes from and work package three is particularly focused on enabling technologies which may enable us to do our work in work packages one and two more effectively, particularly to uh, improve the precision of pharmacodynamic monitoring, possibly using intensified non-invasive sampling approaches that are not destructive uh, of, of, of the animals concerned. Work package four is a particular point of contact for us uh, with CPTR, at least in the initial stages of our engagement. So work package four is, if you're going to try and optimize a preclinical pathway, well, what are you going to compare the results with? And you may be surprised to learn that 
a comprehensive repository or representation of clinical trial data in TB does not exist. We have some systematic reviews, but we do not have a global overview of how these different combinations of drugs have worked historically uh, or how they may perform in the future. So one of our activities in Work Package 4 is to assemble a database of existing individual patient data clinical trial data. And that helps us to provide the context for evaluating our integrated modeling framework. And we want to do this in such a way that even within the lifetime of the project, we will be able to, to, in, to engage with researchers outside the consortium, both data donors and custodians, and those who may be interested to make use of the data, so that this will ultimately, at the end of the project, become a global resource uh, for research use. And Work Package 5, of course, is where much of the action is. So I think it's, quite, it's been quite a new experience for many of our laboratory scientists to be working so closely with PKPD modelers, modelers who are providing them with consultation on optimal design of their experiments, making their experiments as efficient as possible, reducing the number of animals that they have to use. Uh, we're taking a flexible approach to this. We're incorporating mechanistic or fully some semi-mechanistic approaches to PKPD modelling so that we can propagate information formally right from the in vitro stage through animal models into early phase clinical trials. And we want to be able to use that information to design those early phase trials in the most informative possible way. And all of this is underpinned by uh, a, a data management infrastructure, and the infrastructure that we're using is the Transmart system. Uh, this has been supported on, uh, for use in a number of different IMI projects and will be so going forward. It's mostly based on open source components. It's inherently uh, flexible enough to support translational projects because it enables researchers to interact with their data uh, after they've uploaded it. And we're, we're using a cloud-based model so that researchers will be able to ac access this, the data uh, in real time. So just to summarize, Predict TB is about taking quite a new approach to drug development in, in TB. And what we're, the approach that we're taking is a model-based approach. We want to be able to use the information that the earliest, from the earliest possible phases of the drug development process and to be able to make use of that information in designing our clinical trials, which is quite an ambitious goal. But the PKPD modeling framework that we're developing will, will, will help us to do that. We need to enhance the pharmacodynamic model if we're to identify those drugs that actually sterilize patients and result in permanent cure, and we're using some very exciting new technologies to do that. We are drawing on expertise that I think has never been drawn on before in the TB field, or at least not in such a comprehensive way. So I'm very excited about um, the people that we have in the consortium, but I'm more excited about the way in which they are working together. And from the start, we have tried to make this as open a model of collaboration as we could, because we feel that the, our activities within the consortium potentially have wider impact in the field. And so there are multiple points of contact, as you will see, with some of the activities of CPTR, the Global Alliance, and some other EU consortia, including those within, within IMI. And we are very keen to make sure that the way that we work, we don't wait till the end of the project to be engaging with those groups. So I'll just close by thanking everyone who is involved in the consortium. Um, there are now more than 100 people uh, in, this, in this group. And just to say that we are exceedingly grateful for the commitment that IMI has shown to the field of tuberculosis by supporting this project. And as I say, our goal going forward is to leverage that with other global partners to make sure that we get the best possible value um, out of this investment and that we genuinely deliver uh, on new combinations of drugs for patients in the clinic. Thank you.